Hey there, this is Paul Frampus. I'm the director of Wiser. I wanted to talk a few minutes about orientation and pre-briefing in your simulations. Hi, it's Paul Frampus. Welcome to our Wiser Minutes video. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about orientation and briefing and simulation. Sounds like a boring topic, doesn't it? Well, I hope not. I want to spice it up a little and talk about some of the behind the scenes aspects of orientation and briefing. So I want to start with looking at some dictionary definitions. I hope most of you know about the online healthcare simulation dictionary. It was a project that was started a long time ago when I was president of the SSH, and uh, it has become an invaluable resource over the years. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to uh, get access to it if you haven't so far. But I do want to talk about a few things from dictionary definitions. I know that sounds a little geeky, but let's just start there, and then we'll kind of work through it. So when we first look at the orientation word, I want to point out what the dictionary says. It says the process of giving participants information prior to a simulation event to familiarize them with a simulation activity or environment, such as center rules, timing, how the simulation modalities work with the intent of preparing the participants. So we'll get back to that. So let's switch gears and now take a look at what this briefing say in the healthcare simulation dictionary. The definition, an activity immediately preceding the start of a simulation activity where participants receive essential information about the simulation scenario, such as background information, vital signs, instructions, or guidelines. For example, before beginning a session, faculty conduct a briefing about the scenario to review the information being provided to the participants. Well, the thing is, if you look and compare those two definitions, there can sound like a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities. But I think that the roles of orientation and briefing are quite different. And as are most things in simulation, there's a great variability and a good way to accomplish them, depending on what your learner group is and so on. So let's first focus on orientation. I look at orientation as the rules of engagement. How does one act in the simulated environment unrelated to a scenario? I think it's fair to link orientation or think of orientation as linked to the learning contract. What do I mean by that? During the learning contract, I think it is essential that we as the faculty and we as the simulation program are establishing a relationship with our learners. And part of that I'm going to dig into a little bit of detail here in a few minutes, but think about that when it comes to your orientation. Think about it as an opportunity to earn the trust of the learners. I think that we can use the orientation to minimize surprises. Adult learners don't like surprises. And what I mean by surprises is things that can happen that were unexpected that the adult learner was not expecting to happen or perhaps doesn't perceive it to be as fair. OK, so this is where if there are things that are going to be simulated and they don't look quite right or it could be easily perceived as something different, we should clarify this before we throw them into the scenario for the learning process. I look at that as part of the orientation process. I think that we should orient uh, adult learners to the flow of the learning activities. What do I mean by that? Let's take a model of a course, a simulation course that has multiple learning activities, sometimes simulation scenarios, perhaps some task training in the middle of it, maybe even a lecture. I think adult learners appreciate the opportunity to have a schedule, uh, to understand what's going to happen. When we throw around words like debriefing and scenario and whatnot, it's very clear in our mind, but many times the adult learner can have a little bit of anxiety about this, particularly if they're not experience at simulation and we need to walk them through it as part of the orientation for the um, learning activities that are that are going to occur. We need to have the adult learner understand what can they expect. What can they expect? I always orient the learners as to what will feel real and I am similarly honest with them about what will not feel real uh, if they're interacting with a computerized simulator for example. It is I think in, inherent that we do that because if you try to engage in the old ideas of suspension of disbelief and all those kinds of crazy notions, then people get really confused. I think that when you can 
have somebody interact with a computerized simulator and understand that there are aspects of it that will feel real about when compared to their clinical job, but there are many things that will not. Nobody gets used to talking to the plastic man, and if they do, maybe they have a different set of concerns. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's keep going. I think this is a great time to give the learners a behind the scenes tour of the simulation center, for instance. I let them know what the control room looks like. I bring them in the control room. I walk them through the capabilities of the simulator that I'm going to use. If I'm going to use the simulator for an airway class, I let them know how does it look when the tongue is obstructed? How does it look when the jaw is clamped shut? What does laryngospasm look like, etc.? And take them through that as an orientation process again, so I'm trying to minimize the surprises that they have as learners. Now, let's talk about some of the variations. Most things in simulation are not cookie cutter. They need to be tailored to the experience that is right for your program, your learners, your learning environment, your learning program. Things that can change how extensive we need to work on orientation or provide orientation uh, ha come in many forms and factors. I'm going to hit some of the highlights now. Familiarity with the simulation overall. So if people are used to the simulated environment, maybe you can cut down a little bit on the orientation as opposed to if they've never been or rarely been involved in simulation before, it's probably better to work on that relationship, work on those fundamental things that can be accomplished during the orientation. Participants that know you well, if if, if you are very familiar with your participants or your student group that are coming through your simulation, that's going to lend one part of ideas of how you will conduct the orientation. If they are learners that you don't know, for instance, you walk into the ward to do an in situ simulation and nobody knows you and you don't know them, I think that you need to work a little more on the orientation to help them uh, with the simulated transition to learning and act acting in the simulated environment. Participants just meeting you for the first time, they might need a little bit more warming up and that warming up can come in the form of orientation. And then lastly, when you do in situ simulations versus planned encounters, uh, the time frame and how you'll conduct the orientation can vary considerably. Many people do unannounced in situ simulations, other people do planned encounters. Either way, orientation can be part of it. Sometimes you delay part of the orientation until after the simulation and then walk people through it, but again, Remember, it's not just about telling them what's going on. It's about earning their trust and confidence in the simulated learning encounter and the value of it. Now, let's switch to briefing. When I think of briefing, I think of briefing something that occurs right before the scenario. This is something that allows a contextual shift to what is going to happen, what is uh, the expectations in this next learning encounter that we'll call a simulation scenario. I think the briefing is more linked to the scenario itself, where the orientation is more to the overall learning modalities and learning program, if you will. Uh, briefing is linked to the scenario. It's a climatization period um, that has to do with thinking about what is your role, what is your goal in the scenario. If you're going to ask people to play different roles in particular, it's very, very important that that is crystal clear in the briefing part. I think that the briefing also brings the context to the healthcare experience. So instead of walking in the room of your simulation center that might look like any other room, which could be uh, a doctor's office or a room in the emergency department or a room on the ward or a room on the ICU, it's important to orient the learner for this encounter, what they are to perceive or work with the idea that they are, be, they are experiencing once they're in the simulation. I think that we also want to clarify what's the engagement during scenario runtime. What do I mean by that? There are varying levels of interaction between faculty members or staff running simulations and the learners. That should be clarified before the scenario starts. If you're going to let the learners ask questions of the, of the faculty member or the person running the scenario, that should be defined. If they're going to ask questions and nobody is going to answer them, that should be defined. 
whatever your rule set is for that particular scenario and that particular learning program, this should be upfront and covered in the briefing and perhaps even aspects of that in the orientation. I think time expectations are always good to give in a briefing, meaning you're going to have 10 minutes in this scenario to do X, Y, Z. Again, remember, our adult learners don't like surprises. And then I always use the uh, briefing to a scenario to remind them, and then after this is finished, we're going to have a debriefing. And I, I kind of remind them of that so that they know that they should collect their thoughts and ideas and be ready to have this discussion, but also to know that if it, in an unspoken way, if they are uncomfortable about something or have some questions that we'll be able to talk about them during the debriefing process. So let's wrap this up. Orientation, briefing, both critical components of successful simulation. I'd like to think it's a little deeper than the dictionary definition because sometimes they sound like they're similar and overlapping, but I think that they are different tools for different things that each have their own set of variations of when to use them, how much, and so on. Think of orientation linked to the learning activity, the bigger picture, and the learner contract, making that relationship more comfortable between the students and the faculty or the staff of the simulation center or whoever's running the simulation. Think about the orientation as time to discuss the rules of engagement, how to interact, when, what's the time frame, uh, those kinds of things, and interactions such as the overall schedule, building some confidence, building some social relationship between the students who are adult learners and the simulation center staff. Build that trust and move forward. Briefing, think of it linked more to the scenario. Roles and goals. When you step inside the room, what are you to do? How are you to accomplish it? What are the goals of the simulation? Those kinds of issues. Think about how do we relate that simulation or, or can we put words into this scenario briefing that link to them why it might be important to do this simulation, how it relates to their real work and those kinds of things. So that's it. Wrapping things up. Again, I'm Paul Frampus. I'm the director of Wiser at the University of Pittsburgh. Contact information for me is right here on the screen. Uh, my Twitter handle, uh, simulatinghealthcare.com is my blog, and I'm on Facebook at Simulating Healthcare. If you take a look on Facebook, I'd appreciate a little like. If you follow my blog, if you subscribe to my blog, that'll be great. You get notified every time I put a new post on. And ways to get a hold of Wiser on social media, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. If you hit our Facebook page, please give us a like. If you follow us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, and you'll know every time we put out another video. So it's been great having this conversation with you. And I want to say until next time, happy simulating.